Previously on Mountain Men, Marty braved a frozen minefield in Alaska. I could walk across what I think is good ice, and I could cave in. While winter's wrath. I can't believe this weather. I mean, it is cold out here. Caused mayhem in the Blue Ridge Mountains. Back, back, back. Watch out! Watch out! Alaska's desolate Revelation Mountains carve out a bleak landscape that's hostile to life. With temperatures regularly reaching 40 below and winds blowing through at 30 miles an hour, only the toughest of animals can survive here. Animals like the wolverine, the ferocious predator that has Marty Majorato's trap line under attack and his season hanging in the balance. Today I'm gonna to head out and uh, check to see if that wolverine came back yet or whether I caught him in one of my wolverine sets. Three days ago, Marty set two traps for the scavenger after it robbed him of fur. He already ate a couple of Martin on me. Oh, crap. And he knows there's food here, that he's not going away. So I made a cubby set. And then the other one is a conor bear killer trap. Hopefully he'll get enticed into one of them. If Marty's traps come up empty, he'll have to surrender the line and start from scratch with only five weeks of winter left. It's kind of an anxious time because the season's almost over. So this is my last chance of catching a wolverine. And if I don't catch him, I'll have to go back to the other side of the valley. Let's see what I got here and my cubby set. Nothing. And he didn't get anywhere near this. And there's no tracks. We'll see if he hit the other sets. Marty only has two traps big enough to snare a wolverine, which he set two miles apart in order to cover the most ground. I'm looking for a sign, but there's no tracks, no sign of anything. But we'll see what happens up here. Oh, this ain't good. This kind of thing just ain't gonna work. There's nothing there. I'm probably not gonna catch anything else, or at least I'm not gonna get it before he does. So I'm probably going to snap this line. I don't want to spend the time and energy trying to get this guy. I'm on limited time and limited traps, and I got a good line producing on the other side of the pass. But the reality is I don't have much time to get out there and move my whole camp. <sighs> <laughs> Look at this here. Fresh set of wolverine tracks. He came up. I mean, there's my tent. And he came up. And he sat right there. You can see he was just sitting on his butt right here, looking right at the tent. He's probably close by. The tracks are only a few hours old. I need to take advantage of it. But I better try and get something set for him. This is my opportunity to maybe catch that wolverine. I have one more chance to make it work. So if I can't give up now. Montana's Northern Rockies were once the home range of the Blackfoot, a Native American tribe that lived nomadically in teepees, 
made of long wooden poles and tanned animal hides. This way of life spanned thousands of years, but today, only a few people still know how to build these ancient shelters using the original techniques. And Tom Orr is an expert craftsman. I'm really into the Native American way and how to do things that people did 200 years ago. It's something that I know, so I can make some money doing what I know. Tom's friend, Will Stringfellow, has a commission to build a primitive teepee, and he's come to Tom for help. How you doing, buddy? Hey, good. Hey, it's cold enough, isn't it? <laughs> Will, he let me in on the deal, so we're going to cut down a bunch of trees to make a teepee. Sometimes you just need an extra hand, and as a neighbor, I know he'll help me anytime I need help. You got everything ready? Yeah. All right, let's find them. They'll need to harvest about 13 trees from the forest to create the teepee frame. Even with the two of us, it's gonna be lots of work. To make these poles, what we're looking for is lodgepole pine. They call it lodgepole pine because that's what the Indians always use for their lodges. Lodgepole pines are preferred because they're sturdy and lightweight but the challenge is finding a full set of 13 that meet the specs of a traditional teepee design. Yeah, where's that perfect tree, Tom? It's gotta be in here. A nice set of teepee poles need to be about 25 foot long, maybe three inches at the base and one inch at the top. There's one. Is it too big though at the base? Yeah, that's one of the problems, is finding these suckers it's really hard to find lodgepole pines that are the right size, the right length, and they have to be almost perfectly straight. Hey, Will, I got one. Come take a look at this one and see what you okay. think of this one. Oh, yeah, that's a beauty. It's a little crooked at the bottom. We'll just have to see what we get out of the top of it. But I think we can get yeah. enough out of it. Huh? Yeah, you bet. Well, if you're going to follow that, and I'm going to get out of your way and go right over here. I think I spotted another one. All right, bud. We finally have found a few that were the right size, the right length, and this perfectly straight as lodgepole comes. The grove produces four suitable trees, but they still need nine more to finish the job. Well, I tell you what, Tom, we may have to move to a little different area. Uh, well, let's look over here. Well, okay. You know, I think it's gonna take us longer than we planned. <laughs> Nineteen hundred miles southeast, in the Blue Ridge Mountains of North Carolina, Eustace Conway is striving to finish construction on the massive lumber shed he needs to get his grassroots logging business running at full throttle. But after seven weeks of hard labor, he's worked himself to the bone. Things are going pretty good with the woodshed. It's going really well. But unfortunately, I injured my shoulder by just lots and lots of lifting without taking a break. Since Eustace's shoulder's been bothering him, he's going to teach me how uh, to run that sawmill. Let's see if we can get this thing cranked up. Ready? Yeah. I've been wanting to learn how to sawmill for years and years, and so this is an opportunity for me to kind of step up and uh, get to learn. Now, there's a lot of little tricks, you know, and I know it's extremely dangerous, and uh, so uh, I've got a lot to learn today. OK, see that? It's starting to roll too far, so we adjust it over here. I got gotcha. you. Now you can roll it. This is the first time I've ever taught anybody to run this mill. I mean, it's pretty risky business. And how about right here now? Like, what would be the best way to be better to tip it up? Yeah, it's it's hard to know. It's an art form, basically. So every, every log, you try to figure out what's the best thing you can get out of it. Usually, I'm the one sawing. 
It's just second nature for me. I mean, I, I like running this meal. It, it's comfortable for me, but for somebody that's never run it, there's a lot of stuff that can go wrong here. Hold on a minute. I want to show you something about that. Well, the carriage is what carries the log up and down the tracks to make it so you can make boards. So it's an important part of the sawmill. We just roll a log on the carriage, and then every time it goes down the tracks, another board comes off. The 100-year-old sawmill isn't equipped with modern gauges or safeguards. Preston will need to learn how to control the carriage by hand and measure the width of each cut by eye. Ah, uh, this is a little tricky one right here. Go ahead and bring it over some. That's right, Woo. Let's just try that. The whole purpose for this is to keep the log tight against the head box. Right. Nothing like a little <laughs> tricky one to start yeah. off with, right? Right. So you can just go ahead and make a pass right there. All right. And always ease into it and generally ease out of it. Looking good so far. All right, then just ease it back. If the man running the saw is not smart enough, he'll adjust the carriage over to where it runs into the saw. So Preston, make sure you don't ever pull that head block out past the end of that. In fact, don't even get it hardly any closer, because if it's sticking out and it swings by or that carriage just walks along, everything will explode. That stuff will kill you when it starts flying. Hold on a minute. It's getting a little hot. It ain't starting to wobble. The saw blade's heating up on it. Something's wrong with it. In the heart of the Blue Ridge Mountains, Eustace is giving Preston a crash course in saw milling. But with the vintage saw blade spinning out of alignment, the lesson has to wait. Preston! Hold on a minute. It's getting a little hot. It's moving, and it just keeps warming up, getting hotter and hotter. Then it really starts pushing. If you're paying attention and tuned in, you can tell when the blade's starting to act up. If you don't adjust that blade right, that thing will get hot and fly out of there. If we have a long punch. We can punch that over just a little bit. But you need a little experience to do it. It's hard for me to do it with this arm. Now, if I'm going to teach Preston how to run this meal, I can't just teach him part of it. I've got to teach him all of it. I've actually used these uh, crowbars and hold it on there and hit it with the hammer. If you want to try it, you can try it. Just don't slip. You'll tear a bunch of stuff up. The three-foot blade spins at a bone-splitting 1,500 revolutions per minute. To accurately realign it, Preston has to lean over its edge and make the adjustment while it's still spinning. And he said, you need to hit this with a crowbar. I was a little wide-eyed for a minute. That's a little spooky. No, you got to hit it. Ideally, ideally, you'd be like that. Boom. But you don't have a good angle. It's dangerous stuff, you know. That blade's spinning wide open right at you. Just a little bit harder. Yeah, there you go. See if that tightened it up. Yeah, see how that tightened it up right there? Well, that ought to do it, eh? Yeah, that's a lot better. Preston! Preston, get the carriage! Get the carriage! Thirty-four hundred miles northwest, in the Revelation Mountains, Marty might have just gotten the upper hand in his standoff with the Wolverine that's been plundering his catch. There was definitely a critter here not long ago, and then he turned around and he ran back right through there. The tracks are less than an hour old. Right now, I'm down to my last chance of catching. There's good sign around here, so. I'm going to set the traps. Something like this, it's like it's game time. We both know 
what the game is, so we'll see who's gonna win here. So the idea behind a, a killer trap is obviously, as the name implies, is to kill the animal instantly. Which is a tall order for a wolverine, but if you can get a wolverine in, in one of these, he's usually yours. Wolverine are suckers for a big bait. All I got is one chunk of moose hide. But the idea is for the Wolverine to come along, see the bait, hopefully he won't, won't want to come over the top because I'll have it covered. Bait will be here and he'll go through there, hit those triggers. Boom, he's done. Hopefully that does it. I'm out of business until that Wolverine's taken care of. Because if he hits the line and continues hitting the line, then I'm in trouble. So hopefully if he comes through again, I'll get him. Deep in North Carolina's Blue Ridge Mountains, Eustace is teaching Preston how to operate the sawmill. At more than 100 years old, the machine has no modern safety shutoffs. Preston, get the carriage! Preston! Woo! <laughs> that was scary. It got a lot closer to that blade than I wanted it to. That thing's got a mind of its own! It does. It doesn't take even half a second to change from calm and working just fine to you're dead. Once Preston masters operation of the mill, it can double the lumber output and prevent the injury from costing Eustace more time. Yeah, it's just a continuous process. If Preston keeps learning, he can learn more and more and more and get better and better and be more capable. Yeah, let's see if we can get these over to the stack here. Get that and all right? Yeah, I got him. That's some pretty oak, isn't it? Every board we make and every day we work on it, we're one step closer to having this dream come true. One more day closer to getting the shed done. Yeah. Yeah, one more board closer, one too. One more board. Back in Montana's Yak Valley, Tom Orr and his friend Will have spent three hours in the bitter cold, harvesting trees for a primitive teepee. It's a tough job, but you gotta make some money somehow. They felled 13 pines of the same size and shape, but now the real labor begins. We cut all the limbs off of them. and then drag them back to where we'll smooth them all down. Tom uses a draw knife to remove all the bark. This prevents the teepee cover from ripping once it's positioned on the frame. We sharpen the butt end of the pole where it touches the ground, so the point will kind of stick in. And then we smooth them all down until you can run your hand up and down the poles without snagging your fingers. And, you know, because of their length, it takes me a long time. How you doing? Yeah, we getting them. I forget how strenuous it is dragging those poles. Normally, we do this in the springtime. It makes peeling the bark off easy. It's so cold, and the bark has gotten a lot harder to peel. Big difference this time of year. Yeah, there is, isn't there? Yeah, the old bark's a lot tighter. You know, maybe we should be charging a little more for working out in this cold weather. <laughs> this is really the wrong time of the year to do this, but there's never a wrong time of year to be making a little pocket money. We got three. 
four, five, six, seven. Few more, few more. And it's so damn cold out all the bark that everything are all frozen. We're trying to finish this up today and it's getting dark on us. How you doing there, Tom? <laughs> Feeling okay? Catch your breath? It's cold, but we're all gonna have to keep working. We're still a long ways from the finishing. Montana's Ruby Valley is 70,000 acres of wild land, home to 20 packs of wolves and at least 50 mountain lions, large carnivores that need to eat half their body weight each week to survive the winter. 10 straight weeks of record-breaking sub-zero temperatures are pushing these predators to the brink, making them more aggressive in their hunt for food. Rich Lewis is on the front lines of the never-ending battle to keep the valley safe. One of the ranchers up the road here had a big mountain lion track right by his house, so I told him I'd come up and take a look at it and see what's going on. Mountain lions are looking for easy picking around a house. He's got little kids, he's got dogs. You never know, you come walking out of the house and here's a mountain lion, you startle it, you're on the ground and you're dead. Hey, Corey, how you doing? Good, how are you? Good, good. Yeah. Let's go up and take a look at it. I have a mountain lion this close to the house is pretty scary. You got a little reed here and wife going out and walking around. You never know, you don't think to look in trees when you go outside to play in the backyard. Oh, there's a lion track right there. Yep. Yeah, he's right there. No kidding, that's pretty close to the dang house. You can see the tracks coming all the way down the road. It's either a young cat or it's sick or something's wrong with it. That ain't normal. It's been so cold, the lions don't have as much to eat and we're pretty easy prey, so I understand that he's worried about that little boy. I mean, I can just see something happen there that ain't gonna be right. The tracks lead back down the road, so Rich wastes no time following the lead. You just can't mess around because that scent doesn't last very long. I'm heading up the road and I lost the tracks, so I'll put the dogs on it and see what happens. A hound's sense of smell is 100 times more powerful than a human's. So Capone will be able to catch the lion's scent from up to 100 yards away. Come on, Capone, come on, load up there. Good boy. I like the dog on the hood because he can smell and saves his energy by riding up here until I find a lion and then I can turn him loose. Here it is up here. It almost looks like to me there's two. And she's got a kitten with her. See that small track walking with it? That's what it is, that little track's her kitten. That's why she was down at Corey's trying to get something for her baby to eat. Yeah, she's gonna be dangerous. She's got another mouth to feed, so she was down there trying to find something easy to get. She's desperate for getting food. Montana's Northern Rockies are home to a growing population of mountain lions that compete for food during the bleak winter months. And the competition gets more dangerous when a mother cougar must feed her cubs. While tracking a cougar that's been stalking too close to a rancher's home, Rich discovers an urgent situation. Once I got out there, I realized that it was a female mountain lion and her kitten. Most kittens are born in the summer and weigh almost 50 pounds by midwinter. 
Their rapid growth fuels a constant demand for fresh kills from the mother lion. You can see the little track right here. That's the baby. Here's the mom. Well, I'm gonna keep following this cat, but I'm not gonna be able to turn my dogs loose. Mountain lions are more aggressive when protecting their young, and the dogs would be heavily outmatched. Good boy, Capone. I know you smell that lion, but I'm gonna put you back in the box. Come on. I can't let you go. She's gonna be pretty dangerous, so I couldn't afford to get dogs hurt or take a chance on killing that little kitten because it wouldn't be fair to either one of them. Well, I'm gonna keep following this lion. I just feel obligated to do something, and that way Corey can be relieved about his little boy playing outside. Rich plans to track the lion on foot to at least make sure the prints are leading away from the ranch, but there's no telling where the predator might be. It's dangerous. You just never know where the lion went to. If that lion happens to jump out of the tree, you're dead. I like to get down and just learn everything I possibly can about that track, just like reading blueprints. If an animal is hunting, they do a lot of different things. They go back and forth more. You know, you look for hair, blood, see what kind of signs on the ground and figure out what's going on. See how sharp the edges are on my hand? You see all that straight down, and this is melted out. But there's still dirt in here. So it's not really old because the snow hasn't melted enough. Here it is up here. I could see everything laid out in the snow. I knew which way they were headed, so I just kept going down and I kept cutting their tracks. That's the female, that's the mom. This is the kitten here, smaller track. Holy f what the hell happened? In Montana's frozen Yak Valley, Tom and Will fight the polar wind chill to complete an order for a primitive teepee, working for six hours to strip the pine trees of their bark. So I got one of mine ready now. I got one done, too. All right. Hey, you know what, Tom? We're in good shape. We've got enough to finish out this set. Yeah. Why don't we just go ahead and I'll stand up wherever we need. All right. All right. The final step is to erect the poles to examine their shape and test their strength. We're going to set up the teepee support, which is made out of a tripod of poles that's tied together at the top. All right. Bring it on up, Tom. Hey, looks good, bud. All right. Let's stick a pole up there and see how it's going to work. All right. You got it? Yeah. Kind of need this one to make those others set up there good. All right, fits All like right. a jewel. We had some of them that were a little crooked and didn't peel very good. So we want to make sure everything looks real nice and all the poles look good. We want these things to be perfect when we take them to the buyer. All right, looking good. Nice set of teepee poles. Yeah, what a deal. These pretty nice poles, Tom. They're going to be really happy with them, I believe. We did good, though, to get all that in a day like that. Yeah. It was really hard to do it in a day, even with the two of us working. But lucky I am to have lodge pole pine that I can harvest on my own property and make money off of. Well, I believe we still got it, huh? Seems like it. How about a sea guy? <laughs> Hell, let's call a little day. Three thousand year old petroglyphs discovered in Maine's Machias Bay 
depict ancient tribes hunting and trapping along the river, testifying to the long tradition of living off the land here. Charlie Tucker has recently found success in these forests and is preparing for a scheduled rendezvous with his friend Jim. He'll hand off the fur he's caught so far and re-up on the supplies he'll need for the next four weeks. I'm lucky to have my friend Jim. He's my lifeline right now out here as far as getting new supplies and getting fur out to the freezer. That sound of a gun's empty. I gotta meet up with him ever so often. I gotta get loaded up. I gotta bring my my hides there. I got buried. Snow can mask scent, so Charlie buries his beaver catch one foot deep within a snowbank to protect it from predators. It's gonna be a pretty good little load. Yes. I got five, six miles to go. I wanted to cross. Charlie's rendezvous point is on the opposite bank of the frozen Machias River. And with fresh snow covering the ice, it's difficult to find a safe crossing. A couple of areas are gonna cross some deeper water and fast running water on the major flowages. And uh, with the weather we've had, the conditions might have goofed up all the saltness of the ice. So I have to go by feel, especially under the snow. And that's when I like to use the chisel a lot. You try to listen for a crack of thin ice. If you get in real thin ice, you can actually feel it sinking. Maybe if I go towards that big spruce, it's down towards the dead water more, so it's going to be solid here. Tapping the ice with a chisel helps to test its strength, but it's not an exact science. So Charlie aims for a large eddy on the riverbank. Here, the currents may be slow enough to produce thicker ice. I'm running out of time to meet Jim. I know I've got to cross. I guess so. So I decide that this has got to be the best choice. But I gotta watch out for the thin spots. He just cracked. I still couldn't take the chance of putting all my weight with the beaver right beside that. The sled alone weighs 150 pounds, so Charlie will send it across first. Well, that son of a gun made her. of Maine's frozen Machias River. Oh, you son of a... Charlie's made a deadly miscalculation. <sighs> the temperature is now negative five degrees. When you're shaking to the bone, hypothermia will set in. <sighs> Oh, I gotta get that coat off. He's wet, god dang. Wet clothes will freeze in as little as 15 minutes in these conditions, whisking away body heat faster than it can be replaced. So I need to get a fire going quickly. They try to warm my body or it will be the death of me. So you're gonna get a couple of these limbs broke off. I need some of them for fire. Yeah, that'll probably do her. If hypothermia sets in, it can cause Charlie to lose consciousness in as little as 30 minutes.
snow and the wind, and the cold's moving in fast. I gotta hurry up and warm up, or I'm not gonna survive. Six thousand feet up in Montana's Tobacco Root Mountains, Rich is pursuing a hungry female mountain lion and her cub that have been stalking his neighbor's property, and the trail just led to a gruesome find. You can tell by the freshness of the blood because it's got a real shine to it. And if it's fresh, you know, the animals are there somewhere and they're close. It had to happen within, you know, half hour before I got there. I don't know if I scared them off or what happened. There's some elk right there, a bunch of bulls. Look at them right there. When animals are spooked like that, you know something's in the area. A female mountain lion has to hunt and kill the equivalent of one deer every nine days to keep herself and her cub alive. Finding a herd this size is like winning a jackpot. And that lion's doubling back, making a loop around. It looks like those lions must be right in there with the elk because them elk are moving off that ridge. And so I'm sure they'll probably start hunting them. The elk herd is a reliable food source for the lion, so she'll likely stalk it higher into the mountains and away from the ranch family. When I see Corey, I'll let him know and that lion shouldn't be back for a while anyway. I'll be a little more comfortable tonight. In the northeastern tip of Maine, Charlie's hastily built fire radiates the warmth he needs to prevent hypothermia from setting in after plunging into freezing water. It's hard to explain how cold this really is. This cold goes right through you. That moisture makes it so much colder, it is unbearable. Charlie's gear is almost dry, but his resupply mission with Jim is in jeopardy. I'll tell you what, you walk all that distance, six miles, on open water, and you get close to where you're supposed to run into Jim, and you finally fall through, is God's darn miserable. I hope he didn't run off on me. Jim is supposed to be just a half mile away, so Charlie piles green boughs on the fire to send him a signal with huge plumes of white smoke. This is a circumstance that I can't give up. I got no choice here. I need more supplies. I don't want to starve to death. I pray Jimmy's out there. I smelled some smoke. He had a fire going. The smoke was coming up the river. I made the decision it's him. So kept moving and moving, checking, hollering. Hey, oh, son of a gun! Hey, 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 I didn't think I'd ever see you. How? Oh. That was good to see you. Oh, it's been a hard day. I fell through. I met Jim here. I was so excited. I knew I had some food coming with the rest of my supplies, and I was going to get rid of this heavy load I've been dragging all day. It ain't no big rich killing, but it's better than I was doing last year. That's a big fire, 50, 60 pounds. There are a lot of signs here, a lot of signs, a lot of beaver. In just four weeks on the Machias, Charlie's bringing home more fur than he caught all last season. The resupply will carry him through another four weeks here on the line. Well, I sure appreciate you coming out, Jim, but I'm gonna have to hustle along. I, I got no choice if I'm gonna make the shelter. I got a long walk, and the uh, weather don't seem like it's gonna change a whole lot, and so I gotta get going. Put it right there, God dang you. This was a big test today for me, and it's a test I passed. It's all about survival, so I gotta be careful along this river walking back to camp. Okay, we'll catch all you right. later. You think about people living out in the woods and stuff, there ain't many people could do that, and he's one of them. There's not many like him left. Tough son of a bitch. Thirty-four hundred miles northwest, in a glacier-carved valley in Alaska's Revelation Mountains, Marty sets out to check the traps he set 24 hours ago 
in one last attempt to catch the Wolverine that's been plaguing his trap line. If it comes up empty, it will deal a devastating blow to a season that is already on the brink of disaster. If I don't catch this Wolverine, I'm screwed. I'll have to snap the line and uh, kind of close up shop here, and then I'd have to move somewhere else. And I don't want to do that, so hopefully I got that Wolverine. Everything for the rest of the season, it depends on this. Oh, oh, look at that! Look at that! I got him! Oh, I can't believe it! I thought this guy had the game won. Stuck his head into the old 330 and it shut the light switch out in a hurry for him. Boy, that's what's cool about trapping. Just when you think you're, you're bested, something works out for you. To me, the ultimate prize is catching Wolverine. They're such neat animals. In this country, Wolverine, they're the king, as far as I'm concerned. They're the badasses of the North. He should be healthy, he ate enough of my bait. <sighs> now that I had caught the Wolverine, it's time to get the line set. Oh, nice heavy one. He's a big one. All right. I need to get the ultimate payoff that I'm looking for and finally trap some fur. But I'm running short on time, so I have to get going. Next time on Mountain Men, winter's fury blows through the great north woods. Oh, she don't let up. I'm chilled right to the bones right now. If I don't find some shelter, I'll freeze to death right out here. And Rich faces his darkest hour. Seeing the herd spook, I knew the wolves were still really close. I'll do whatever I got to do to protect the livestock. <laughs>